Folks, welcome to video one, lecture one, for our Synergies Protocol uh, video lecture series. Now, in this first video, I said we're going to be talking about energy systems and energy itself. Where does energy come from? Deep in your cells, where does it come from? It doesn't come from caffeine, even though you might think so. It doesn't come from smoking crack or doing crank or sticking a needle in your arm. It doesn't come from shot of bougre. If you get that throwback reference, wow, props to you. Anyway, when I'm talking about energy, where does our biology get it from? It gets it from a chemical called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. ATP is your gasoline, your cellular gasoline. When we're talking about muscular effort, ATP pretty much exclusively provides the chemical energy necessary in muscle contraction. All right. So really, in order to create energy, our body needs to create ATP. More specifically, if you want to get into it on a chemical level, our energy comes from phosphorus, phosphate bonds. It's called adenosine triphosphate, right? And really, uh, and this is going beyond what we really need to talk about, but you have this adenine group attached to a sugar or ribose molecule, and attached to that is a triphosphate group. Your body will break that chemical down with various processes, turn it into adenosine diphosphate, so it's missing one, or monophosphate, where it's missing two. And it's the breaking of those bonds that releases chemical energy for your body to use. And in our case, specifically, contracting muscles. In athletic performance, that's what we're going to be talking about. Well, deep inside of your very fiber, your very tissue, there are wondrous processes taking place that are creating ATP all the time. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. These are your energy systems. Now, there are three major energy systems, but they do function at different capacities. Um, so energy is created in more than three ways, but for argument's sake, for a simple outline, we're going to be talking about the three major energy systems. The first is called the ATP-PC system. All right, well, right away, we have ATP in there, All right, so that's recognizable. The second is called the glycolytic system. Third is called the oxidative system. And then we have to talk a little bit about this before we go any further. <clears throat> These are the three major pathways in your body by which it creates ATP. Now, before we go any further, I need to give you a disclaimer. The information I'm giving you is severely retarded. And when I say that, I don't mean it's wrong. What I mean is these are very complicated processes. This one, not so much. This is pretty simple. These two had many steps, many chemical reactions, and they're horrifically complicated. They even act, interact with one another. Now, I'm in a simple way identifying them separately. I'm going to show you very simple guidelines, identify which ones are dominant in some type of activity you're doing. But understand this. In the real world, all of them are always active. All of them are always doing something at some capacity. And there's relationships between them as well. So while it's going to look very simple here, understand that there's much more to it than this. All right. And you know, if it's something that people are interested in, we could always do a future video about it. But for now, we're going to lay it out as the most simplistic way possible so that we can go further into our video series and kind of get into the meat and potatoes of what all this means. Now, the reason there are three different ones is they work at different capacities. And the big things that separate them are, are going to be, number one, the duration which they're active. Okay? or the duration they're dominant. The second is going to be their fuel source. Where do they get the materials necessary to create the ATP, right? The next thing that's going to be important is what are their limiting factors? All right. Why do they only work for certain, why are they only dominant for certain durations or at certain time frames? And the last thing we're going to be talking about is the type of recovery you need for each one. Seconds, minutes, days, whatever. All right. So here, let's go up here and let's talk about the first one here. Your ATP PC system is the energy system your muscles use that is for high intensity, explosive, powerful work. There's that word intensity we're going to be talking about in the next video. But for now, understand that this is for very hard work. 
that's very short duration. You know this. You can only do a max clean and jerk one time. And that's exactly what you'd be doing with this energy system. Or a vertical leap, a max vertical leap. Or an all-out sprint. This system's only going to be dominant for 1 to 10 seconds. After that, you have to get energy other places. All right? The fuel it uses is right in the name, ATP, PC. So we know what ATP is. PC means phosphocreatine, or creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate. You may have heard of creatine before. It's a supplement. One of the reasons it works, and it does work, is that it helps your body hold more of this creatine phosphate. The ATP PC system is a simple chemical reaction. I told you after your body breaks ATP, it's left with ADP, right? Well, your body's going to take creatine phosphate and use that as kind of a, a shuttle to attach a phosphate group to that creatine diphosphate and recreate creatine phosphate. It rapidly recycles this energy molecule, all right? It can do it quickly and powerfully, but only for a short time because it's a simple reaction and you only have so much of this. Guess what our limiting factor is? Well, we're going to call it substrate. It's a substrate limiting factor, meaning you only have so much of this available. Once it runs out, the reaction's over. You can't get energy there anymore. All right? Now, this, although it's powerful and fast, is the least efficient energy system you have. Um, depending on what you're doing, you need long rest periods. This is why lifting very heavy requires long recovery times. All right? This is why sprinting as hard as you can can't happen over and over and over and over again. You need some recovery time. Um, generally speaking, you're looking at 16 to 32 times the amount of rest compared to work. That's not very efficient, right? But think about it, you know, you spend a few seconds doing a very heavy set of like three bench press, right? Maybe you spend like 15 seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. Well, you're going to need a couple minutes to recover. You know, that's going to be that like that 32 or 30 or 28 times what you did. It makes sense. Um, there was a gentleman who did a meta-analysis of effective recovery protocols for strength training and other types of training. His name was uh, Jeffrey Willardson, I believe. Uh, he made a simple recommendation. If you want to make, um, if you want to gain strength, uh, three to five minutes is an effective rest period. And typically speaking, if you look at how long strength sets take and you compare that to three to five minutes of rest, that's about what you're getting. All right. So that's your first energy system. The second one. I think we can all agree, sometimes we need to do things for longer than 10 seconds. Well, that's why the glycolytic system exists. This is a system that uses sugar. Um, so right away we can stick that right here, I'm kind of talking out of turn here. But it uses sugar, uh, specifically glycogen, which is broken down into glucose and then into further types of, sub of substrate, which you can use for energy. Uh, one is pyruvate. <clears throat> one is NADH. NADH. NADH, NADH, um, and so on and so forth. It breaks sugar into these other chemicals, which then can undergo other processes, all of which end up creating ATP. Like I said, it's more, it's more complex than here's sugar, let's turn it into energy. There's a lot going on here. And again, it's complicated, but understand, this is a more complicated process. There's more different substrates being used here. They're shuttled off to different uh, reactions in the different parts of the body. And ultimately, you get more energy you know, per sugar than you do for each phosphocretin. It's like a one-to-one -one reaction. Depending on the type of glycolysis, typically you're getting like eight pieces of ATP per reaction instead of one-to-one. -one. All right? Typically speaking, this system is going to be dominant for 30 to 90 seconds of work. What's this limiting factor? You've probably felt this before, especially if you've done some type of bodybuilding, some type of work to failure. If you're lifting and your muscles start to burn, and then they start to slow down, and you can't move them as quickly, and the reps become a struggle if you're curling weights, right? This is the limit, you're feeling the limiting factor, and the limiting factor is actually the buildup of metabolic byproducts. Lactic acid begins to build up in the muscle, and your body can't get rid of it quick enough, right? You're working for 30 seconds, work for 20 seconds, you're fine. You start getting closer to 90 under load, and you start to feel that taking place. You're running out of places to put waste, all right? Typically speaking, you're not going to run into the same type of limiting factor here, the substrate, although, you, now you can run out of glycogen, but you have an awful lot. You have hundreds of grams of glycogen between that stored in your muscle and in your liver, all right? 
And that's actually the liver is where part of these reactions take place further down the chain. Now, you can run out of glycogen, but you shouldn't. Um, if you're an athlete running out of glycogen, or you're running out of glycogen, something is seriously wrong. Now, if you have a metabolic disorder like diabetes, it can happen. Um, you know, but typically speaking, if you're training well, um, if you're not overly fatigued, if you're eating well, your diet's good, you should not run into hit what they call hitting the wall. It should not happen. Now, if you're a marathon athlete, right, you're running for these long distances, you can run out of glycogen. It's possible. But then your strategy is incorrect. You should be replenishing it as you run. All right. So typically speaking, you should not run in, although you can hit a substrate limiting factor here, you shouldn't. Now, if I was emperor and you were competing in my Olympics and you ran out of glycogen, it would be straight to the gas chambers, dishonorable discharge by execution. Because really, like I said, as an athlete, your strategies, your training should be better than that. You should not be running into that problem. So typically speaking, the first limiting factor you're going to see is going to be the buildup of metabolic byproducts. That's what's going to happen. Recovery for the synergy system, three to four times um, rest to work. So you can already see this is a lot more efficient than this one. All right. It's also working for longer periods, but the reaction is more complex. So it doesn't give you energy quite as quickly. Now, I think we can all agree, sometimes we're doing things like living for longer than 90 seconds, and that's where the oxidative system comes into play. The oxidative system is always ever-present, always working, and it should be your number one source of energy. It's the most efficient. It's working throughout the day. It's why you breathe, to oxidize things. So the oxidative system is typically dominant for three minutes and longer. It's working all here. You're breathing, right? It's working. Um... However, it's not giving you as much energy as these things up here, but it's there. It's always working. And when you're doing a task that you can continue to do for three minutes or longer, it's the dominant energy system. A lot less is coming from up here, you know? Um, the fuel here, this is a complicated one. There is something called aerobic glycolysis, and sugars are used, and your body also oxidizes fats. Always oxygen is present, and you need to breathe to allow this to happen, so oxygen is there. Fatty acids are the things we're going to be talking about mostly. But fatty acids also require sugar in the oxidation process. So sugar is also important down here. Sugar! There it is. Limiting factors. You typically don't um, have a limiting factor in the oxidative system as long as you're breathing, as long as you're alive, except for the fact that it gets overtaken. Energy demand gets too high. You start needing energy too quickly for it to satisfy the need. And so your body has to move to other fuels, other reactions that more rapidly produce ATP. So in this case, um, you know, you're doing something, you're jogging very lightly, everything's cool. Now you start to break into a sprint, right? Or you start to break into a fast run. As you get faster, as your heart rate goes up, your body recognizes that it can no longer get the energy from the oxidative system and now the glycolytic spills over, okay? That is where that comes from. Recovery, typically speaking, if you're doing something like this, a one or two to one rest to work is going to satisfy the oxidative system. Now, this is the general outline um, of how your body creates energy. There are these three different processes. Like I said, they're more complicated. There's also, you'll notice these big gaps in the middle. So John, what about 20 seconds? Well, like I said, really all of them are always active. If you're working for like 20 seconds, you're getting power from here and here. Probably mostly from here, and the spillover is being absorbed by this system. So this system is dominant. This one's dumping energy in as well at a lower capacity to make up for what's necessary. Likewise here, all right? So that's a general idea of the energy systems of the body. Again, I wanna make sure you can see the board, get all the information, think it's, it appears to be legible enough. All right. I'm going to leave this information on the board for the next video. Because in the next video, I'm going to be talking about the first major concept of this synergy protocol, which is going to be talking about intensity and talking about how we're going to address intensity in each of these energy systems versus on one big spectrum. Okay. So that's going to be video lecture number two, redefining